Hey guys, what's up? So just landed in San Antonio, Texas and um, I'm pretty excited to spend the next two days with the one and only living legend of the card magic, Richard Turner. I'm Richard Turner. I'm a card mechanic. I can fix a card game. Would not want to bet against a Texas man. He's considered the world's greatest card cheat, spending decades refining his skills. This guy can't see. You're legally blind. Well, how could you possibly fight? I don't know. Find out. Don't tell him he can't do something. He can't see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's another word for blind, I guess. I'm just Richard Turner. You can just introduce me as that. Hello, hi. is that Maxim? Hi, Richard. Welcome, Thank welcome. You. Come on in. Thank you very much. Richard, hi, how are you? Maxim, how welcome are you? to our home. Welcome to our home. How are you? This hi, is my hi, wife, hello. Kim. Kim nice, nice to meet, to meet you. you. Pleasure to meet you, Thank Kim. Thank you so much for coming. This is the shirt okay. uh, for Richard. It's oh, a linen nice. shirt. This is traditional embroidered Ukrainian shirt. Uh -huh. And uh, my favorite is uh, candies. <laughs> Candies. Yeah. Me too. What kind? And this chocolate? <laughs> oh, wow, Richard. You look so, it yeah. looks so good on you. <laughs> did you have my size? How did you know what size? It looks perfect. It does. It fits perfect. Shoulders, the length. It feels so nice. I love it. I love I it. You look, nice. you look like a real Ukrainian. Uh, uh, but I don't sound like a real one. I sound like an imitation <laughs> Ukrainian. Kim said that you recently moved here, yes, right? Yes, and we redid the entire house to our style. Uh -huh. and, and our last house, we had this Venetian plaster. So our guy that does it, he was with Disney for 16 years, and he did all the texturing wow. for, for their different sets and stuff. So he, he uh, he's the one that... Um, uh, helped us uh, design and, and that's pretty cool yeah watch your step coming up now this is our dog judah this is his this bar is, okay this is his wet bar so if you want um if you want a a, a bowl of uh, dog water or uh, dog food all right he, he serves it here so it's the judah bar our dog the judah bar we're just gonna let it ride as it rides and you bought lots of lots of batteries for lots that. of batteries okay good. we got everything uh -huh. So where are we going, Richard? Uh, we are going to go to Ripley's, believe it or not. I was nine years old, 1963. My sister and I both got scarlet fever. And for me, it was within a matter of moments I was sitting in my fourth grade class. Mrs. Gaston was the teacher, and I, she was writing stuff on the board, and we were doing math. And I was looking at my math book, then I went back and I looked at the chalkboard, and the writing that was clear all of a sudden looked like someone took the eraser and smeared it all around. It was just a blur. And I went, I sat there trying to open, open make my eyes focus. They can, they were out of focus, and of course I'm a little boy, so I'm not understanding really what's going on, except it was there a minute ago, and now it's not. And I looked down at my book, the words, and all of a sudden the words are just a smear. And I'm going, uh, I said, uh, Mrs. Gaston, um, something's wrong, I can't see. I can't see the board. And she says, what are you talking about, Ricky? I said, I don't know. I just can't see the board. So she sent me to the nurse, and then the nurse uh, had an eye chart. And they put you back, and back then, they, it's a E. That E was pointing, and she had started at the bottom, and I said, I can't see. And then the next row, I can't see. The next row, I can't see. The next row, I can't see. Then I got up to the third row, and I, I started, I kind of could see that. And then the second row, I could see that. The first row, I could, the top one, the one I could see. And she goes, something's wrong. We need to have you see a doctor. 
Do you play piano? No, I just bought it because I like the legs. I like okay. it. To me, I like feeling antiques because, I, like I said, I call it three-dimensional art. I always think about the, the person that went through the trouble of carving. You right in front of you, yes. Yeah. Of, th you know, of carving. You know, you think about carving the legs and making them the same. You know, that's a mass masterpiece of, uh, of uh, skill. And then take over to the, the, to the chairs here. There's a king chair. All right. They were they were done from Germany, and um, and you can see that the carved lion heads on the top and the and the cherubs and the, and the soldiers. And then if you go in on, there's six other ones that go with it. And if you look at each one, like the vase, the vase yes. that she's holding, each one's a little bit different, a little bit bigger, one's a little smaller. Sometimes the, the head will be a little bit bigger, the hair will be a little bit different. So they're pretty much, it's not pretty much, but they, they are unique. Yeah, exactly. What well, you think they, about when they made every, them. Okay. When they made them, that, that was an artist, you know? They didn't like today, stamp, stamp, stamp it out. Machine, you know, exactly. Manufacturing, right. Yeah. So I, I always, that's why I like it. I, just, I call it, like I said, three-dimensional art because you can feel the workmanship and the love that went into it. There's, we have like 20 rooms in the South. We'll just go through a couple of them. <laughs> when I first the, started losing my sight there and the, the nurse is, telling me what's going on at first i thought cool i don't have to do continue math at the same time i'm going but i can't I'm, i can't see things are blurry and so i had two things one as a little kid like oh you know, bad weather outside don't have to go to school and you're glad about that but at the same time you're you're not getting your school work done you know, all different directions through the whole city the whole downtown is around the river. And what's, the, the, what's the name of the river? San Antonio River. The, San Antonio River. Uh, and okay. like it, it one part even goes right down the thing, right in the middle of the hotel, through out the back, down the Hyatt Hotel. Uh -huh. So we might walk down that after we go through Ripley. So that's what you hear over there. Yeah. That's actually the sound of the river going down the steps in through the hotel and then back out into the river. Because the river just winds all over the whole city. Got it. And um, and I remember one time that we were at an eye doctor and the eye surgeon, the eye doctor, told my mom, we're sorry, but he's going to have to go to a special school for the visually impaired. At that time they called it visually handicapped. And I remember my mom, you know, breaking down and crying. And for one of the first times in my life, she actually hugged me. And uh, that was probably the first and last time. She said. And um, why was that? Well, because I wanted a mom. I, 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 I really didn't have a mom. She was very detached. And I think, and then as the sight went, the more detached she became. It's like we were uh, damaged goods. And she, for whatever reason, kind of uh, rejected us at that point. I like the feel of certain types of things on my f f uh, feet okay. when I don't have shoes on. And so I, li I like uh, 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 tile and wood. I like wood floors. All of our floor floors are wood except for our, our gym. Anyway, this is a... Uh, All right. And then our sitting room. And these are Victorian. That chair's there. And I can't remember what else we have in here. <laughs> Richard, tell me a little bit about Kim. Kim? Well, she is my treasure of all treasures. Uh, there's a verse in the Bible that says a man sold all he had to buy the pearl of great price. And for Kim, for me, Kim is that pearl of great price. Put it another way, I've had other relationships over the years. And in her case, I would, I would never have traded my talent for a woman. I would never have traded my money or wealth or whatever I had at the time for a woman. Kim, I would give all I have for her. Rather, I would, in other words, I would give up my talent, I would give up my house, I'd give up whatever I had uh, for the pearl of great price. Oh, wow. And she's like the other half of me. Um, she's one of the smartest persons 
that I know. She's extre extremely bright, well-educated, and uh, well-spoken. And the thing is, if you, you, if you want to have an argument with her, don't even mess with it. One of her degrees is in speech communication, English literature. She was a number one debater on the northwest coast of the United States in college. So in, in, in the, all the years we've been together, not one time has she ever raised her voice to me or ever called me a bad name. And um, that's thir 30 years, well, 30 years now. When was the last time you take you you've taken a ride on this? Uh, ten years. Ten years. You should you should take Kim for a date. <laughs> she, <laughs> she will. She, she, she will. I'm, she taking, will. I'm taking her to South Africa. I'm taking for her. A, to that, that's a good date. That's our date. Listen to that. Oh my gosh, he's talking to us in his own language, and we do not want to. I do not want to reply to him because I don't know what he's saying to me, but I know whatever it is, it's probably our friend. Oh my gosh, they're talking to each other. Yeah, I take her for really, really, really cool dates now. And I don't, I took her for this one when I came like out big here. boy's date. Big, big boy, big girl date, yeah. <laughs> big girl date, yeah. Before, That's pretty when cool. I first moved here, because I moved here before her because I was hired to do my, do a six week thing. And then when they first opened, and then they, uh, they made me a, a nice figure, six-figure deal to stay, uh -huh. and uh, so then she came out, and when she came out to visit me, when our stuff was still in San Diego, I took her here on the boats, and I took her to the caverns where they have the where the the st stalagmites and stalactites. That it's here in San Antonio. Yes, it's here in San Antonio. Okay. All these big, big caverns that go all over the place, and then I also took her to where they have the bats. The bats at night, they'll come out millions, millions and millions of bats. And I'm not like, some exactly. caves or yeah, something. Caves. Yes. Yeah, caves. Okay. Yeah, in San Antonio also, between here and Austin. And the thing is, they don't want to get rid of them because the bats eat the fleas, the mosquitoes. I mean, and so the bats are a good, uh, good thing to have. Natural, in your natural selection. Yes, they they, they naturally <laughs> select those. Big time. They big naturally time. select those mosquitoes and gobble <laughs> them up. <laughs> he was known as the father of close-up magic. He was the most influential person in the area of magic and sleight of hand over the past 100, 120 years. He was also known as the man who fooled Houdini. And that took place 100 years ago, I think this year, 100 years, 19, 1920. And uh, for, uh, I had the privilege of working with him for 17 years. And he devoted his life seeking out gamblers because all, all card working of all magic, the gambling work was the most secretive and the most closely carded, guarded information was how to control the card game for two reasons. One, the, the magicians would do stuff for the purposes of entertaining. The gambling work was for the purposes of taking money at the mm -hmm. card table. And the second reason why it was uh, so the work is so difficult is one, it just takes years to learn. Two, if you got caught, you got shot. And um, I had a friend who said, Di Vernon, the professor, wants to meet you. He heard that you can do some difficult moves with the cards. You know, because I had ways of dealing seconds and dealing out of the middle and some shuffles. And because I was obsessively practiced, I was a teenager up to 2021, and I just turned 21. And uh, we were going to meet at a place called the Magic Castle in Hollywood. It's a world famous private club. It's 27,000 square feet. And it's a Victorian mansion. Wow. Yeah, this oh. is your famous I had a room of cards. And this is only, a, this is just my, what I call ready to go move, room. Because I have a lot more than this. This is just the, you know, I grab it to go and I grab some to go. So they're, it's my ready to go stuff. So and how many decks you have here approximately? About 6,000 decks sitting right here. This is the gold seal bicycle, which actually has a card inside that says tested and approved by Richard Turner. I get a 
called, Professor wanted to meet me, we're going to meet at the Magic Castle. And I just finished working with uh, Bob Yerkes on some, uh, 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 an actress, I'll leave her name out, and he said, oh, by the way, you have to have a suit to get into the Magic Castle. And I said, a suit? I don't have a suit. I, can, I can't afford a suit. I'm making four bucks an hour working with Bobby on, you know, as, as a gopher. And so, but I had my gambling money. I always had a little stack of 20s from my poker playing. So I went down to the Northridge Shopping Center and I went up to this, in this men's coat loading store, put my cards on a rack and I started thumbing through coats. And the sales guy comes up to me and says, I'll cut you a high card for that coat. And I thought to myself, this is my lucky day. I said, okay. He goes, no, no, I'm just kidding. I said, tell you what, come over to your desk. And I took out two twos and a queen. And I said, I have two twos and a queen. I'll move them around. If you tell me where the queen is, I'll pay double for the coat. You keep the difference. Otherwise, if you miss it, you give me the coat for free. And he said, really? I said, really? Well, darn if he didn't miss. My hands are faster than his eye, even in slow motion. So I said, tell you what, I'll give you a chance to get your coat back. Put the coat against a pair of pants. Lost again. Okay, coat pants against a shirt and tie. I walked out of there with a brand new suit, didn't pay a dime. Some of the ways that he taught me and I figured out how to do it, he literally worked on for 20, 30, 40, 50 years and never accomplished it. And so he basically taught me how to take possible out of impossible. Eight, two, three, two, permission to record the visual image of my person and or the sound of my voice for documents. Items, new multi-select list box, phone letters on phone pad. Nominees and assigned may use any motion picture, video, still photo, or voice. This is the Academy of Magic Arts Close-Up Magician of the Year. The, your yes. famous, your famous uh, award that yeah, you... I have, I have a couple of those. You're only allowed to win two, and I have two. Uh -huh. They're up here somewhere. They're uh, a wand. Do you see them? Where are they? This is the... Oh, right, yeah. right here. It's in the middle, yes. Yeah, the, yeah. Um, yeah, that was, uh, this is the equivalent of the Oscars, like the, uh, the movie industry have the Oscars, the TV industry have the Emmys, the on stage Broadway have the Tony Awards, the um, country music have the AMA Awards, uh, and this is the AMA Academy of Magical Arts Awards. So this is the, the equivalent of winning an Oscar in our industry except for the difference with this and the Academy of Magical Arts is that it's a worldwide competition where like with the Oscars, it's only uh, United States films. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's a lot harder, a lot of harder competition. And then they have 5,000 members that will vote on who the, um, who the winner is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I think that most uh, high achievers have to have another high achiever person next to them so that you can understand what they're going through. Now, in terms of high achievement, Richard is up here and I'm like down here, right? So, um, first of all, I feel blessed that he is a high achiever and I understand kind of what goes through his head and his mind uh, in all of his achievements that he has. So. As another high achiever, I have to appreciate all of the extra effort that he puts in. But in keeping him grounded, it's just kind of reminding him that, you know, everybody doesn't work at his level and he needs to dumb it down just a little bit to make other people feel comfortable and maybe not have such high expectations. And the other thing that we have to do, Ace and I have to do this a lot, is we have to remind him it's okay to just rest. You can let it go for a little while. Maxim. Uh, Maxim. Hey, Maxim, you got the pizza. He's got the pizza right. and I got the Judah. <laughs> oh, and, and uh, 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 Rosanna. Yes. Uh, if you have your camera, get yeah, the I dog get the dog in his chair. Right. Right. You found the pizza place okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is that cute yeah. picture? Yeah. 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 I'll, I'll get out of the picture so you just have a picture of him no, sitting. I like his, I like his oh, okay, come here. Kiss, kiss, kiss. Kiss, kiss, kiss. kiss. Oh, that's my puppy. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Hi, I'm Glenn. Is this the, is this the entrance, uh, Gary? Yeah. 
No, so let me make sure I'm in front. Yeah. And let me talk first. Are we going this way? Hello, uh, Richard Turner. Uh, Clay Stewart has uh, some tickets for us. We're going to do a little filming at one of the exhibits in here. Weird things, and that's what Ripley's was all about. Is that's why it's called Ripley's Believe It or Not. The dog and I like to come out here and and uh, sit, and it's very, it's pretty quiet. All right. Depending on which way the wind's blowing, sometimes you can hear the freeway off in the distance. Um, but uh, nobody can see us. In other words, if Kim and I want to go skinny dipping, we're free. Do you know what that means? <laughs> no. It means you go and swim naked. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> got it. <laughs> oh, Judah. Oh, come, come on, in. you little troublemaker. You said, don't forget the doggy. Uh, and then uh, this is just a little montage of this different celebrities I've had the privilege of entertaining, like Johnny Carson, Gene Kelly, Gregory Peck, Jimmy Stewart, Bob Hope in the middle, Siegfried and Roy. I won the what was uh, called the Golden Lion Award from Siegfried and Roy. And, um, and then, of course, Muhammad Ali, who was a wonderful man and a wonderful friend. You just mentioned Muhammad Ali. Uh, behind you, behind you, the signed picture of uh, Muhammad Ali. And uh, would you tell us uh, what he, he wrote on, the, on, the, on his photograph? Uh, he would you? Do you remember, or will yeah, you want I, me? I, I think I remember to Richard Turner from Muhammad Ali. You are the greatest card mechanic of all time. Just sneak in and say hi before you get too busy. Oh, How are you doing? Oh, I very good today. Oh uh, yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> that let's say better than normal. <laughs> okay, better than normal. <laughs> And I started working with the cards as a little kid from watching Maverick with James Garner. It was a TV series. And he would, he would play this cool cowboy gambler. And uh, some hustler would come into town and he would out hustle the hustler. And I thought, I want to be a cool gambler like Maverick. And we were a card playing family. And we were very, very poor. Our house was literally a box set on top of a ditch. The ditch was about six feet deep. My dad poured concrete over in the ditch, and that became my breakfast, my bedroom. Mm -hmm. And in the winter time, the rain would come in. There was nothing to hold it out, and so I'd sometimes be sleeping under three, four, five, six inches of water under my bed, and I had asthma, and so I was deathly ill a lot of the times growing up. Two, yeah. Um, nah. so you're yeah. I'm, yeah, 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 the property cards. What, what do I have? Cool. So Richard has his uh, Texas Showdown game or Shark Showdown. I'm not too sure what he's calling it now. He's created games for all the years that I've known him. He's been a game creator as well. And so he likes to have the boys over once a week uh, for a couple of hours and they play uh, the board game together. And so today, I uh, am having the wives over as well, and so I will be hosting the wives and just having, you know, tea or coffee and chatting with them and getting to know them a little bit better while the men are playing their board game. When you're when you, oh, you drew into a win. And where does 10 take you, though? That's going to be the real question. Yeah, so 25, 25, 26. Ooh. Oh, 26. I was 20. So we would play cards for uh, M&M's. It's a candy in a bag called M&M's and then different colors in there. And I play with my sisters and the reds were the most valuable. I wanted their red M&M's. We play cards and I would get those reds. Then I, once I got the reds, I wanted greens, yellows, and finally the lousy browns. And so that's how we, uh, I started developing moves with the cards to win the candy for my sisters. So I had all these cards, boxes of them. Kim said, get rid of them. It takes up a whole room. And I thought, I'll build a ca card house. No, too many. I'll build a card castle. So I started gluing them together back to back like this, one after the other, after the other. 
So the base weighs 160 pounds by itself. And then I did it in layers so that I could move it. So it weighs 825 pounds altogether, almost a half a ton. And and I put the different people that are in the real Magic Castle in Hollywood that are in the uh, Hall of Fame there. All the people in the Hall of Fame have a caricature done of them and, and they hang at the real castle. So I took those pictures and I had them miniaturized and they're in the castle in different places. And Diver and the guy I mentioned that I, worked, I trained with, there's a picture in the back of he and I mentors. shaking hands by card mentor. I was honored to have a film done about myself and the producers they're from, they were texans mm -hmm. luke Corum was the director russell groves was the, one of the producers and we had really top uh, editors and and cameramen it's touching so, people all over the world and yes um, it, i have to say i i'm very thrilled that a story you know is making people feel like no matter what the situation is there's hope they can make it, they can do it. There's no obstacle that's uh, too great that you can't surmount it. If you have the willpower, and if you believe in yourself, and you believe in others, and you will accept others, and the help from others. DELT, D-E-A-L-T, like you said, is an acronym, and D stands for dreams. It's our dreams that fuel the fire in our belly, the dream, our dreams that give us that get up and go and want to do it. And E stands for excellence. What opens doors is becoming an expert, achieving a state of excellence. And Professor Vernon would tell me, if you could do anything better than everybody else in the world, people will try to break down your doors to meet you. And A stands for analysis. We have to analyze our obstacles. We have to analyze our assets. We all have obstacles of one sort or another. Uh, if it's procrastination, that's to me, that's one of the worst obstacles of all is people that procrastinate or lazy or uh, use excuses or, and then we all have assets and we, we have assets that we don't even know what they are. But we find out what those passions are, those assets. And, uh, and then we uh, learn to develop and capitalize on them. L stands for loyalty. You know, a person is not loyal to their business, company, colleagues. That's not a person that you want to have working for you, nor is it a person that you want to be in business with. Um, so you, you, you must be loyal and you must be loyal to your, I think I said to your God, to your family and to your friends and to your colleagues. And T stands for tenacity, which is one of my favorite words. And I even like the way it sounds. Tenacity, ta 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 ta. It's all ta tenacity, tenacity, t t t t. And what is tenacity? You know, tenacity means to like a poker player go all in. Tenacity breaks down the barriers that stand between us and our dream. Dream at the beginning, tenacity gets us there. I needed to feel like I had to be dependent on others. And the thing is, we all need help from others. And I just had to let my pride get out of the way and you know, my ego get out of the way and, and just say, like I did with you, Maxim, let me have your elbow. Keep me out of trouble. I don't want to run into my own piano and break my leg <laughs> or break my piano. It would even be worse. Either one. <laughs> Either one. <laughs>So as I was building it, um, I built it on our deck in the back of our, uh, we came in our, our house. And one time, the, if you see the, the, the seams are black, and that was masonite to separate the different layers. And I didn't know my, my can of uh, oil-based paint spilt on the ground. <laughs> and Kim comes out and says, did you by chance, um, walk through the living room and then through the kitchen into the bedroom into the bathroom and I said uh, yeah I had to go to the restroom she says oh I thought so and I said why uh, oh because you spilt paint all over you have footprints all the way through into the, the house but that's how that's all the reaction that, that, that I got from her is 
that uh, she goes, oh, I thought so. She did you start yelling and screaming, you just put paint all over that entire house and that's oil based, we'll never get it out. Let me ask you, how did you propose to, to Ken? I would, how I proposed to Ken yes. is, I said, uh, we, we would go to this place called Mission Bay, it was a, it was an amusement park. And they had a 19... Where, where was it? San Diego. San Diego. Mission Bay. And they had a roller coaster. Right. A wood, one of the oldest wooden roller coasters in the country. 1922, I think it was. Wooden roller coaster. Shook like a crate, like it was going to fall apart. <laughs> and so, uh, I said, uh, we would go ride that roller coaster. We'd right. the, we'd, during our dating time, we'd sit on the beach and uh, go on these different things they had at the place. Then I said, let's go to the roller coaster. She said, okay. And I said, oh, but I need to stop and get a cigar. And she goes, she, that's what she's thinking, a cigar? You don't, you don't smoke? And I said, I, I still need a cigar. In fact, I need two cigars. And so we stopped at a cigar factory on the, you know, uh, on shops, the way there. On okay. the way. And so I get two cigars. I take this, took the bands off the cigars. And now we're on the roller coaster. Okay, we're seated, okay? And it's starting to go up. And I said, I took her hand and I said, I want I don't want to ask for your hand in marriage. I want to ask for both of your hands in marriage. And I took one of the cigar bands and I put it on her right hand. I said, I don't want to ask for your hand in marriage. I want to ask for both of your hands. And I took the cigar band and put it on her other hand. And she sees two cigar bands and she goes, yes. And uh, so now the roller coasters went up like this. And if you slide a hand, I removed the cigar band and replaced it with a, with a diamond ring while we were going up, and then I moved my hand at has, the, has, right at the peak right. of the road. So she went, ah, ah, because she saw the <laughs> ring the second the roller, the roller coaster dropped. So she hasn't noticed it, actually, when you, when you removed the cigar band. Oh, she noticed the second oh, I moved the right. cigar band, she saw it, went, ah, ah, she went, ah, ah. You know, so one was a, ah, it turned into a cigar band, turned into a diamond ring, and the second was, it was, we dropped. And she, her belly, her stomach wasn't ready for the, Roller coaster drop. That's how I asked her to bury me. How do you even come up with this? Uh, with this? <laughs> My um, first director, Steve Terrell, he, we would be on stage. This was 1972, 72, 73, 74. I was in a theater company called The Lamps Players. And Steve Terrell was a movie and TV actor back in the 50s and 60s. And he formed a theater company. And we'd be doing the scene, like you and me here. And when I would be doing my scene, to, I'm, I'm talking to you here, but I'm looking over here. Because I, I remember there's that hat. So I'd move over here, and I'd look at you like this out of the corner of my eye. And he's down there trying to direct the scene. He goes, um, Rick, they call me Rick Richard. And he says, um, you're looking off to the side. When you look off to the side, it doesn't look right for the scene. Um, it's gonna look strange to the audience. Why, are, why am I talking to you here and I'm looking over there? And for most of my life during those years when I would be talking to somebody, I'd always be looking off the side and they would go like this. They'd be looking behind them going, what's he looking at? You know, because they couldn't figure out why I was looking down over there when I'm talking to him here. So Steve taught me how to square my head towards the voice and give the impression that I could see people. He, and he kind of phrased it the way, the way I learned it is, a sighted person plays the part of a blind person. Mm -hmm. He says, flip it. You're a blind person, you play the part of a sighted person. So when I did my shows for years, I would, ne you know, I would never mention it, nor would I allow it to be mentioned that there was a visual situation. And, uh, and I would do everything I could to give, uh, and I purposely would look around, look like I'm looking at things, and then I train myself to look at things close up and distance because you have your forward, your close up vision and your forward, your long vision. You know what I'm talking about? Your, your lens, when you want to look at your, your eyes change if you're looking at something at distance here. And uh, so I had to learn how to do, uh, to pretend that I'm looking at something close and then, and then have the other pretense that I'm looking at something uh, from a distance. So that was a, that was a training. And I've been trying to teach my sister to do it, but she can't. She, she has a hard time with that. Tell me when you're ready, Olga, and yeah. make sure I'm looking at my head where you want, my head, eyes where you want. Okay, and my eyes okay? Yes. And then give me that three, two, one, so I'll think about okay. something funny. One, two, three, go. Yeah, yeah. Wow, you 
took those fast. So let's move. Ready? Yes. I am a perpetual motion machine. When I was growing up, I was known as a, they called me a perpetual motion machine. I was called Dillian after a half hour sitcom of uh, uh, the skinny guy that never could sit still climbing trees and, and that was me. And is there something that could slow me down? The thing is, why would I want to slow down? My whole life is nothing but an adventure. I would say it has to do with Richard's uh, perpetual motion that he's in all the time, whether it's fidgeting or uh, wanting to go somewhere or doing something. He sometimes doesn't know when to stop or to slow down. And so that can be a challenge sometimes because I don't have as much energy as he does and I like to hold back sooner than he does so it has to uh, has to be that um, sometimes when Richard is ill which is not very often Ace and I are like yes he doesn't feel good he's going to bed we can all relax now I would say that would be one of the most difficult things to deal with in terms of his energy level I am a professional motion machine and I want to continue putting in the practice they uh, we have a friend that he would say chill to me you know which is a word for relax let's relax to me relaxing is not relaxing relaxing is punishment break the hold here strike here here strike from here strike from here somebody's behind you that way that way spin keep them off go for the groin underneath you uh, earned I will stress it earned your uh, your belt and um, the article uh, correct me if I wrong they handicapped or disabled uh, fighter wins a black belt yeah they said blind man Bl or blind man it irritated me so I never showed anybody that article and it was on the front page of the LA Times sports section biggest paper one of the biggest papers in the country and um, and I didn't show it because I always wanted my work to stand on its own. When I say stand on its own, in other words, I didn't like the theme, handicap makes good. I wanted it to, he, he did it, uh, his, his accomplishments are a stand on their own, if that makes sense. So I didn't, I didn't want uh, it to be handicap uh, made it. I wanted it to be that I did it on their level. And, I, uh, and even with the, the, the disability or the, the vision situation, so. On Wednesday, he earned a black belt in karate by fighting a series of three-minute bouts against 10 different opponents, each of whom was fresh. By the time the test was completed, Turner's hair was matted to his skull, and it was a wonder he could hear having Sha shouted at him for nearly an hour. When you train, oh, when I train, always start with the bad side first. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you're going to do kicks, I always start, if, I, if I'm naturally right-legged, I will start left-legged. Always start with your bad side first. I, I start losing my side at nine, okay? And for, from, from, oh, during my teens and 20s, my vision was 20 over 400. That's twice as low as what's considered legally blind. Uh, legally blind is 20 over 200, so I was twice as bad as that, and I had no forward vision. The macula, which is the center part of the mm -hmm. retina, was gone. It dissolved when I was a kid. And so just picture wherever you are, there's a hat in front of your face. So I'm fighting. Wherever I'm, wherever my eyes are, there's a hat blocking it. So I'd always have to look out of the corner of my eye just to know where the target was. And then that, and out of the corner was 20 over 400. So it was a blur. So also all I do is once I saw that blur, and that's why I was never a counter puncher. I was always the aggressor because if I was a counterpuncher, I just got hit. 
So I just, as soon as they say yelling, bam, I, I just move right in and, uh, without any any hesitation. So I'd always start, but then once I got contact, then I knew, you know what part of the body is. You want another one that's really bad. You know, she graduated St. Mary's University. Okay. And the person that she was talking about, Dr. Deacon Neville. Okay. I said, I want to get her a, a, a university ring, St. Mary's University class ring. So he picked one out for me and everything. And uh, okay. <laughs> uh, I, I got to make sure I say this in a way that I won't get slapped. Not by you, but by her. I understand. <laughs> um, and so uh, I wanted to make, give it to her in a very unusual way. So we're making love, and I have it in my hand, and right at the point of climax, I put it in my mouth, and I kiss her, and I transfer the ring from my mouth to her mouth, and she thought a tooth fell out of my mouth, and she turned like this and spit it out. <laughs> and I grabbed it, I said, no, 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 take a look. It's a it's a ring for your graduation from St. Mary's University. <laughs> How old were you? Oh, that was 25 years ago. What helps find discipline is to find passion. It's hard to be disciplined about picking up dog poop in the yard because there's no passion about that. So you have to you have to find what you're passionate about. And that will help create discipline. If you find you're passionate about running, running marathons, you know, you you run marathons. If you're passionate about playing an instrument, you know, you play an instrument. You, know, you find what you're passionate about, and that will create its own discipline. And then once you do have your passion, then of course, like I said earlier, you start off at a small level to where you cannot talk yourself out of doing it. And then you go a little bit further, five minutes one day, six minutes the next day, seven minutes. And then that discipline, your body starts getting used to it and it creates its own discipline. Discipline breeds discipline. You start doing it a little bit more, a little bit more, and eventually uh, people are having to put a noose around your neck to get you to stop. Years, I didn't like if anyone brought up the subject of the guys visually impaired, the guys vis uh, legally blind and now totally blind. I would get very upset with people. And I turned on one of the biggest shows on television back in 1981, a show called That's Incredible, because they wanted me to walk with a white man with a blind man's white stick. And I refused to do it. And they, they finally came back and said, how about we just interview, interview your eye doctor? I said, oh, I'll tolerate that. Um, and it was partly because I didn't want the stigma, and I, of course I was, uh, as a kid, there were times I was discriminated against and beat up because of it, and other times people would all of a sudden change. You, know, you have dinner with them one day, and they treat you normally, and the next day they find out, oh, the guy can't see you, and all of a sudden they're, they're acting like you can't even serve your own food, and they're trying to over, over help you, and they're being polite. But I, it always bothered me, and then, um, and then when I finally lost all of my vision, and it took me a full year before I even accepted it, the, and I would just literally run into the house, run into poles, run into the solid brick buildings, just splitting my head open every every few every couple weeks, and my wife would say, "Let people help." But like I said, when it, it really did set me free from myself and my own pride and my own ego to uh, say, you know what, we have what we have and sometimes it's okay to give somebody a hand up. And, uh, and I'm always glad to ask for it and receive it. I'm gonna hang on to your elbow, keep me out of trouble. Sure, 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 sure. Okay, let's watch the step coming. So where are we going? I don't know, we go this way. We go to the front. This piece here is uh, out of Belgium, the, on the left side of the entrance of the house. Am I in the hallway here? Yes. Yeah. Um, and, then, uh, and then, once again, you can feel the carving, the soldier here. And I just, I just love the way they... So how do you pick uh, these antiques? How do you pick I, these touch, pieces? I go, I feel like I go, 
yes, Kim, we have to have this one. And she goes, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I go, yes. <laughs> she says, too much. I said, it's, it's nice. And then that's a clock from the 18... 1870s, the clock in the wall of the sconces. The, the are you are you buying it all over the all United over the States or all over? All over, all over yeah. Okay, all my elbow. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, and uh, the feast on the left is French, uh, from the south of France. Right. Uh, the the bedroom set or the kitchen set uh, it actually seats uh, it actually seats 12, but we only have it open part way. Okay. And um, and uh, and it's actually a 12. Uh, 12, 15 piece set, uh, that big carved legs. Like, look at that. Uh, think about the work. Yeah, the that's a look. Do that. And I don't know if I've ever thought about that I've sacrificed a dream that I had because I had dreamed of being a school teacher, but after I went to school, I realized I wasn't equipped to be a school teacher. Right. Um, I think initially when Richard and I started performing together, I didn't really want to do it, right? That was his profession, but he said, oh, you're a great actress, you have to do it, people love you, you think you're funny. So when we first started doing it, I didn't necessarily feel good about it, but I did it just to help him. What's that card? It's a heart. And I'll uh, cut one more card right out of the middle. But then eventually I learned to love it too. And I realized that there were some benefits for myself of having been in the performing world with him and um, being by his side. Now, there are times when he would travel that I would like to not go with him, or when he is getting ready, I would like to not have to get his clothes ready. And for a while, he really did uh, want me to be there all the time. And then I remember at one point I said, look, this is your dream, not mine you need to be a little more self-sufficient and not have me there all the time. And it was hard on him at first, but he agreed to it. And he really, he stepped up to the challenge. And so I was able to go back into my profession, which is, you know, business. And so I assist him in running his, uh, his life and his performing schedule, but I don't do it all anymore. So it's kind of, a partnership and making it happen but in the long run I don't think I lost anything I think I gained a lot because one of the things we do when we go to perform or to travel or to go to another country we like to think of it as another honeymoon which is a chance where we get to go on another adventure in a place and recharge. see people and recharge and see people that we have never seen before and we go there and we just decide to relax and to have a really good time. And then we come home and we go about our daily lives again. So Great. It's, it's been beautiful. Well, by CBS again, I can project in front of me whatever I want to Im image I want. And I have a different exercise or a different image for every exercise. I'll start with the bench press. I'm laying flat on the bench, and I will see in front of me a, a, a cable going up across two pulleys. On the other end is Arnold Schwarzenegger and a big old gorilla or some monster. Uh, and as I go on to do the rep, when I get to the point of exertion, don't do it the whole time, you're wasting your brain. Mm -hmm. you, when you get to the point of exertion, I will then focus my mind on that image of those guys pulling that weight up. And when I see that, I don't feel it as I go up. So my muscles will continue to press without feeling the stress. So that's a, that's a trick that I've learned so I can do tremendous amounts of repetitions. And I have a different exercise, like, uh, like you're, doing, you're laying on the floor and you want to do a, a tricep mm -hmm. uh, hammer. You have a weight. And what I see when I'm laying like this is when I'm doing the actual contraction, when my arm's doing the work, I see a hammer falling. And when the hammer's falling, when, and for real, when the hammer's falling, that's the least amount of resistance. It's pulling itself down, right? Because right. the hammer's falling. So I will see the hammer falling when I'm actually doing the work. And when I put my, I focus on that image at that at the point of exertion. You don't do it like I said all the way. You wait till you get to the point of exertion, like a quadricep extension. You straighten your legs up and back. I will see a giant rubber band all stretched out. And then when my legs come up, it, the rubber band's pulling my legs up. 
and I will watch that image going up and down. And when you're, if you're running, you run behind somebody and you lock your feet in their footprints. Your feet are moving, they're pulling your feet along. So when you get to the point where you start getting tired on that Iron Man, you just lock yourself behind somebody, use them to pace you, and then lock your feet in with theirs and let and see the image of their feet pulling your feet back and forward. And I taught this to Kim oh, a, a dozen years ago or so, and, and my wife Kim has a second degree black belt in Wadokai, and I mean, she has a second degree black belt in Taekwondo and a first degree black belt in Jukido. And she hits hard and kicks hard. I've seen her take 40 men, 40 pounds heavier than her, and just knocked a snot out of them. They go, well, Mrs. Turner, you hit hard. And they're young enough to be her son. And she just kicked the crap out of them. Uh, our routine is I get to get up very early in the morning and that's when I get to do my running or some of my weightlifting by myself in the morning and then I read my Bible and then after that point Richard could get up and then uh, what we do is on Saturday mornings and on Wednesday afternoons I go somewhere else to work out I go to Pilates and Richard kind of works out by himself and then on all of the other days when I get home from work then we work out together in the same room. I like to say discipline breeds discipline. The more you do something, the more you can do of it, and then the better you do it. Five. Ooh, that's gonna put you out of the, no, it's not gonna put you out of the, you're rich, that's mine. Five. Wait, no, I'm, uh, wait a minute, I'm one. Two hearts. Two hearts, is there? It is. It I'll is. go to two hearts. Ooh, Lord, did they already did it? Yeah. I'm oh, sorry about that, guys. I didn't take one. My then the usual. 40, 40 for the six. See what six takes you? Okay, four, uh, $40? $40. Three. Three, and I'm on space, uh, takes me to space three, three, three aces of spades? Yeah. Okay. Oh, there's the last one, thank you. Oh, that's the last one. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, suggestion you should consult uh, people how to propose <laughs> or how to be romantic and, and keep relationship uh, 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 fresh fresh and well that's because and see Kim is you know she pretends that she's serious right and she is serious she is, and yeah. she's very business like she rules the roost I mean when she's doing her business right. she is in control she's not intimidated by anybody she's not impressed she don't care if you're in, in the biggest Brad Pitt or if you're uh, or if you're a plumber, she does. She's not. She does not show favoritism, or she's not impressed by someone's status, wealth, or anything like that. Yesterday, while waiting for the table for the restaurant, uh, Richard was sitting next to you and uh, sent you a uh, love tag, <laughs> which was super cute. Yeah, I guess it was cute. <laughs> So yes, he sent me a love text. He was sitting lower than me and I was turned and I was talking to someone else. And he sent me a text that uh, he thanked me for putting my butt in front of his face and that he was going to kiss it. And I uh, texted back to him, 
that he needed to be careful because I did not want to butt heads. That was the funny text. And so, you know, of course, I'm a goofball, and I'm, you know, certified. I'm always certified, and so I'm always cracking jokes. And she'll, she, she, we have a running thing. I'll say something stupido. She says, she'll just say, bend over, bam. That's why there's no hair here anymore. Yeah, awesome. yeah, all oh, the back right. fists, it, it wore my now hair. Now I got it. That's now you know why. And so she, and she just tells me, bend over, because I know I'm getting, or uh, and Luke, the director of adult, he even will see me say something, and then I'll, I'm sitting there, I'll, I'll go like this, like I'm, I'm preparing to be hit. And so he even knew when to expect that I was expecting that I was going to get back fisted, you know, and it's all in love, you know. And uh, so she will, she likes a person with a sense of humor, even though she'll pretend that is stupid. You say it, don't say or oh, don't say it again, don't say it. But yet inside, she loves humor. I think it's important that um, when you have a relationship with someone for a very long time, that you have to very much guard your heart and your thinking towards that person. And whether it's through prayer or through meditation, I think you need to kind of lift them up and always have encouraging thoughts about them and positive thoughts for them and asking, you know, God to give them blessings because if you don't, the world itself is kind of crazy. And so um, if you don't keep that up, I think very quickly that you can allow bitterness or anger or something else to enter into your relationship. And when you think and you pray positively about your spouse and for your spouse, that you find that your heart changes toward them. And I think that's how you keep the relationship on very solid ground. I don't think I'm here by accident. I think I'm here by design. I think there's a creator behind the scenes. Just like I don't think the Statue of Liberty created itself. I think there was an engineer behind the creation of that symbol of freedom. And uh, in the sense of I'm not here by accident, then I'm here by design. And, and it took me a lot of years to get to the point, but my life and purpose in life now is to encourage, inspire uh, others at the, while in the process blowing their minds.